Right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Mark Pinto, Adult Services Director at Phoenixville Public Library. And welcome to what is our ninth presentation in the Community Gardening Around the Village series. Uh, tonight's talk is the buzz about bees. Um, a shout out of thanks to our partner organizations uh, for the series, the Phoenixville Communities That Care, the Phoenixville Recreation Department, Phoenixville Area Transition Living Landscapes, Penn State Extension, Camp Hill, Kimberton Hills, Phoenixville Hospital, Trellis for Tomorrow, Chester County Food Bank, and Steel Town Village. Thanks so much, guys. We couldn't do this series without you. It's great to have all of you as partners, too. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, let you know about the uh, upcoming uh, presentations. We have two in July in the series. We have a wild plant walk along the Schuylkill Trail with Martha Napolitan Cownap of uh, Camp Hill Village, Kimberton Hills. That's going to take place on Monday, July 19th at 7 o'clock. You can register for that on the library's website, www.phoenixvillelibrary.org. Uh, we are limiting uh, space for that. I believe it's 15 participants. And then on Thursday, July 22nd at 7 is our next Zoom presentation in the series, Sowing for Fall Seedlings with Ryan McCon of the Chester County Food Bank. And you can sign up for that one too on the library's website. So we're happy to have with us tonight, Melissa Jarzma. She's a beekeeper who has been a busy bee herself since 2015 and is going into her seventh season of beekeeping in Phoenixville. What had been a hobby grew into a business in 2019, selling uh, local raw honey at area farmers markets. Melissa, welcome and thanks for buzzing in to present to our patrons tonight. All the bee puns, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so I have a, because we couldn't record it at there, we couldn't go to the hives at this time in the evening, I pre-recorded a inspection that we can walk through uh, with everyone. Um, and that we'll start out with just a couple of basics about, hopefully I don't mess up the technology on here. <laughs> okay, so I think I should be sharing my screen now, right? Yep, looks good. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. The buzz about bees, the wonderful, wonderful world of pollinators. So um, well, that's a little honeybee there on my cover. And this is what my hives look like at one of my locations. So there are four, three stacks here and two small, what we call nucleus hives at the end. Um, so this is what they look like in the summer. They're typically multiple boxes high. Um, and the height is about as tall as I am. So it it's a lot of work stacking those back up every, every week. So the basics about beekeeping, uh, there's a lot of time involvement. It's once a week, you go through the hives and ensure the hive health. You'll take honey off if there's honey available. And that's basically about March or April through October, November, a lot of it's weather dependent. Honey production is roughly the end of May through August or September. Again, weather dependent, um, depends on what's blooming, how much rain we get, um, that kind of thing. Uh, we get about 30 pounds per hive is the state average. Um, it can be over 100 pounds of honey per hive if it's well managed. Um, in the fall, we do mite treatments, which is the biggest problem that we have, at least around here. Uh, the varroa mite is definitely the hive's uh, biggest enemy. And then throughout the winter, which again, October, November through about uh, February, March, uh, periodic winter feedings, which can be anything from uh, dry sugar to uh, fondant, their sugar boards, there's a whole bunch of different methods. Everybody has a favorite. And we kind of joke in beekeeping that it's more work than a cat and less work than a dog. <laughs> Just to give you an idea of the time investment. The cost is around 500 per hive for all the equipment, the boxes, the stands. Um, if you can do it yourself and you have the power tools, that's fantastic. Uh, but it's if you buy from somebody else, that's about the average cost. Then you have a suit or jacket or a veil, uh, gloves, hive tool, smoker. That all can run you 300 to 500, depending on <clears throat> whether you get a simple veil or the full the full suit and boots and everything. Then you have the honey extractor because you have to get the honey out of the frames <laughs> somehow. Um, you can do that a little cheaper 
or a little bit more expensive depending on the volume that you're doing, uh, buckets to store the honey and bottle it, and then uh, jars and containers, which varies very widely. Um, and then if you're getting a package of bees or a local nucleus, and of course the local nucleus box is just five frames of bees with a queen, uh, but if you get it locally, it's going to be more likely to survive than bees brought up in a package from Georgia where they're not acclimated to our climate. Um, just tends to work out better if you get them from a local beekeeper and you're supporting the local economy all around much better. And the best way to learn instead of just diving in and buying bees is to be an apprentice. We have a really great mentor and apprentice program with the Chester County Beekeepers Association and they will line you up with someone who has already been beekeeping successfully for years and make sure that you learn everything throughout the whole year of beekeeping uh, so that you're set up to go on your own. <clears throat> and then of course, hopefully that mentor will continue to stay in touch and answer questions if you have help or uh, the folks at the beekeeping association will help out as well. We have monthly meetings and a bee chat on Fridays. It's a great group. So I'm going to move into the hive inspection. I think I need to unshare this one and share my player. There we go. Hi, and welcome to the Community Garden at the Reservoir Park in Naperville, Phoenixville. Today we're going to be going through one of the beehives back here and taking a look. Volume is very low, Melissa. Hi. Okay. Really hearing anything right now? No, I'm not either. When you uh, share it, make sure you have the button checked for um, the audio. Share, make sharing the audio. It's on the share screen. And maybe start over. Yeah, stop. Stop the share. Okay. <laughs> okay. Technical difficulties. Yeah. All right, then you know, share it again. Go oh, I see. This. Yeah. Uh, this one. Okay. <laughs> Start that over. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to the community garden at the Reservoir Park in the borough of Phoenixville. Today, we're going to be going through one of the beehives back here and taking a look under the lid to show you what goes on in a beehive. I will inspect the hive to make sure that they're healthy, that we have a queen who's laying eggs and that everything is going exactly as it should be. And it is a gorgeous Saturday here in June and the bees should be in a great mood. You can kind of see them go coming and going and having a good old time today. So the sun is out, flowers are blooming, everyone's in a good mood. <laughs> While honeybees are pretty docile, it is better to be safe than sorry. So I always get in my full suit. So we have a whole bunch of zippers here. Okay, we are ready to go. Okay, so the first thing we do is light our smoker. And I use a, um, usually some various and sundry grass clippings, weeds or whatnot in the bottom, and then a little bit of cotton uh, material on the top. Basically you want something that's gonna smolder really well and not burn too fast, because you want it to produce smoke, not fire. So that looks pretty good. Let's see. See the smoke coming out? Yeah. All right. Okay, so we start here, give them a quick couple pops of smoke, just kind of lets them know that I'm here and I'll be bothering them today. And I always do that first thing, so it gives them a second to think about the smoke. And the smoke mostly, uh, it calms them. So it kind of switches their little bee brains from attack the intruder to protect the inside of the hive. It also masks the pheromone they release when there's they sense danger. Um, that pheromone smells kind of like bananas, which is sort of interesting. We always start off with a hearty, hello ladies. 
<laughs> no one's jumping out to come see me. Everyone's really working happily. Usually when they fly out right away, it means that they're in a little bit of a mood, but I think we're looking good today, which is always good to see. So we just took off the roof. This is the inner cover and I'm going to lift that off. I've given them a little bit more smoke. All right. We want to check the back side of the inner cover just to make sure the queen's not on there and I don't see her. Just a lot of bees, which is good. And put that down here so that they can climb back in if they need to. Um, sometimes the house bees don't really fly yet. Their wings haven't developed, so we want to make sure that they can still get inside the hive if they can't fly. All right, so I'm actually going to take this top box off first because I don't need this right away. So again, we just give them a little smoke to let them know that I'm here. And you can see it kind of drives them deeper into the hive which is good. So I can lift this off. Okay, just move the camera a little closer so you can see what I'm seeing here. So this hive was set up, oh, I think about four weeks ago now. Can't believe it's been that long already. So they've been, the queen has been in here busy laying eggs. They have been doing a fantastic job. Honestly could not be happier. They are really doing well. So let's see if we can see what we can find in here first of all. So this is the hive tool and mine's kind of gross because I've been using it for years now. <laughs> so I'm just using this to separate the frames so that I can grab one out real quick. Okay. Sort of grab one end here with my fingers and then get the other end with the tool. All right, let's see what you girls are up to. Okay, so on this frame, you can see all the bees crawling around. There's no queen on this side, but that is all, those are all capped brood. So you can kind of see in some of the corners, let's see if I can support this well enough. There's a couple of open cells right here that have larvae in them and the larvae are just developing bee kind of like a caterpillar um, after they go into a pupal state like a butterfly they end up in this capped cell that's just capped with beeswax so all of that's looking good there are actually a couple of eggs too might be a little hard to see but in those darker cells right here oops right here <laughs> there are a couple of eggs which is good. So we already know that there's a queen in here. Even if we don't find her, we know that there are eggs being laid. So sometimes if I'm busy, it's a hot day and the bees are unhappy and I'm unhappy because it's a hot day, I will just check for eggs and close up shop and <laughs> call it a day. Um, but we wanna do a little bit more involved stuff going on so that you can see. Okay. So we'll just grab that next frame over here. And again, I'm just gently separating with the hive tool. Since I already took out a frame, I can just grab this one with my fingers. Excuse me, girls. All right, this one's a little heavier. So we've got more capped brood, which is good. We wanna see that for sure. Again, that means that the queen is in here. She's been laying eggs like crazy, doing a fantastic job of it. Um, there's some pollen in the corners here. You can see the shiny stuff in the cells, that's nectar. And then just next, next to that, the orange color is gonna be the uh, pollen. So that's usually what you wanna see in a frame. You wanna see the brood in the center, and this is a ton of brood, uh, surrounded by pollen and nectar. So that's the food for the developing bees. It's kind of like having your bedroom next to your buffet <laughs> or a buffet next to your bedroom. Sort of makes sense to have everything exactly where you need it. I'm going to set that one on the side again. And 
then let's check the next one. See what these girls are up to. Okay. So we've got another frame. They haven't quite finished drawing out. This one's neat because we have various different stages of developing larvae and eggs, kind of everything in between. So again, the capped cells are capped brood. And you can kind of see, see you can see in those cells, hopefully, there are some eggs and larvae and they're all in different stages. So the worker bees will be an egg essentially for three days. And then within the first, I think it's 16 days, uh, the larvae develop and they become capped. And then worker bees take about three weeks to go from egg to adult bee emerging. Drones take four weeks to go from egg to adult bee. Those are the male bees. Everything that we've seen on these uh, frames so far have been female worker bees. Let's see if we can find some drone brood out in here. <laughs> There's a food storage frame. Ooh, ooh, we do have some larvae in here. That's good. And eggs again. But that at the top here is capped off honey. So they are working on stacking away all kinds of honey already, which is good. That's what they should be doing. Makes me very happy. <laughs> okay, so that box looks good. We're gonna go down one more because I really wanna check in and see exactly how the whole hive is doing. Again, this is something I probably wouldn't go this far in a normal day because I've already found eggs. I know they're happy, I know they're healthy. Everyone's behaving exactly as they should. I've seen eggs. I've seen brood. I haven't seen the queen, but that's fine. The eggs let me know that she is in there somewhere. I do kind of want to get a peek at her, though, if we can. So I think that would be fun. All right, so there's some fun stuff going on in here, too. I don't see any eggs. But we see some pollen, hopefully. There we go, pollen. Lots of pollen. No eggs on this one, it's in the bottom though. Sometimes the queen ends up hanging up mostly, hanging out mostly at the top. But all those bees are working away, which is good. Yeah, I have a feeling the queen isn't down here. So we're gonna put that back together and probably just go up a level. So the worker bee, while I'm putting this box back together, the worker bee lifespan is only about four to six weeks in the summer. And in the winter when they're not out foraging, uh, they can live as long as three to four months. It's a little bit different. The metabolism slows down, they're eating honey and they're just trying to stay warm. Um, so they live a little bit longer. What really shortens their lifespan is the fact that they're out flying. That's kind of what um, Sorry. <laughs> it's always hard to talk and, and beekeep. It's a lot of concentration. So the flying is what really shortens their lifespan. Um, all that hard work, it's kind of a testament to a good life lived when you see a worker bee with wings that are a little bit ragged. It means that they've worked tremendously hard. Um, and they've done a lot of good work for their hive. Kept their queen alive. They all have slightly different jobs too. So there are dozens of different occupations inside of the hive. And again, this is all the worker bees. The drones don't do anything for the hive. <laughs> they go out to mate with a queen and then they don't return. <laughs> uh, they die in the process of mating. So the queen comes back after having mated with dozens of drones, um, but the drones don't come back. And they're usually not drones from her own hive either. So she wouldn't be uh, mating with bees who may be brothers or half brothers. Oh boy, check that out. This is all honey. 
You can see this shiny in the cell. That's nectar. It hasn't been capped off yet, so it's not te technically honey, but it is all nectar that has been brought in. They are probably slowly filling it cur or curing it down into honey. Nectar comes into the hive around 80% water. They cure it down to about 16 or 17 percent water so it's really just sugar in the long run so you can see these bees at the top with their faces in those cells they are depositing nectar into the cell from their honey crop so they have a little kind of storage space right before their stomachs uh, where they store nectar so these are the house bees they haven't actually gone out to collect that nectar they are probably the third or fourth in the line at that point. So the bee that actually collected the nectar has gone out, come back, given it to one bee, given it to another bee. It's usually passed around about three or four times before it eventually ends up in the cell. All right, so hopefully, hopefully we find our queen on this hive. And I know I just added a queen to this one the other week. And they are super busy. That top box was completely full of, uh, almost full of honey already. Which usually you don't see the first year that a beehive is active. Usually they don't produce honey, but this one is rocking and rolling, which is awesome. We'll take it. <laughs> they must have a very productive queen. She has done a lot of work. Oh, there she is. Do we see her with the little red makeup on her back? The little red dot. That's our queen. Now oh, she'll be in that frame laying eggs. Looks like she's trying to stick her head in those cells to see if there's one that's ready and that she's ready to lay in. But usually when she's out in the light, um, she's just looking for a place to go to the dark. <laughs> she is beautiful. I'm doing a really good job looking around. Looks like we've got a couple of boy bees running around. This frame had, a, or this hive had a lot of drones. The previous queen was just laying drones, which result from an unfertilized egg. Worker bees, let's see. Worker bees are a fertilized egg. So the queen decides what she's going to lay, depending on the needs of the hive. Let's see if we can get one close up. I don't know how well that's going to work. We'll see. All right. Now well, she's hiding in there. <laughs> Come back out, lady. It's time for your close up. Okay, so let's put her back in. We know that this hive has a queen, and they are collecting honey, and we have seen eggs, and. There's a drone. Come here, bud. I can see him crawling around in my hand here. That is the male bee. And you can see his eyes are bigger than a worker bee. And he has a fuzzy butt. He also has no stinger. And all he does is eat, <laughs> basically. And fly around looking for a virgin queen to mate with. It's a rough life. <laughs> All right, let's put him back in the hive. Come on, friend. Okay, this is a hive that I just split out last week. So what they're doing is creating queens right now. So you can see these, um, flip this around the right way. Okay. You can see these little peanut shaped structures that are hanging off the side of the comb. Those are the queen cells. So they're developing three right there. They usually develop more than one queen cell so that they make sure that they have a good queen. Um, they kind of do this Marco Polo sort of game. So the first queen that emerges will make a piping sound and then the queens in their cells will make this low pitched quacking noise. So basically the queen that's emerged goes to try and find the other queens to end up being the queen. <laughs> and the worker bees will have some say in that. They will either bite the legs of the queen they think is inferior or help the other queen to find the queens that they think are inferior or keep 
the one that they like or the one that they dislike away from the other ones or kick her out of the hive. So it's not exactly entirely the queen's choice who becomes the queen of the hive. The worker bees have a lot of say in that as well. So out of those three cells, we'll end up with one queen in the end. Um, so this hive has got queens in progress. You can see the uh, brood in here and our queen cells. Let's see if I can point them out. Are these little three right here. So they're already a week old, so they will start emerging next week. And then it takes them about another week or two to get mated and finish developing and be able to lay eggs. So hopefully in about two to three weeks time, uh, we will have a laying queen and this hive will be queen right, queen right and working hard at collecting honey. We do have a fair bit of honey up in the corner of these frames and in a lot of the frames that are in the hive. So they have been working really hard already. They're doing a great job. Let's see if we can get a nice close up of those queen cells. There they are. This is just a quick video showing you the queen bee making her piping noise. All right, let's go back to the slideshow. I think I have the right one here. There we go. So we just did the hive inspection. So we'll go on to the basics of the hive and how it works. You have one queen. She lays up to 2,000 eggs per day in the summer. And that number starts out lower in the spring it slowly increases throughout the summer and then it tapers off again towards the fall. It is 90% worker bees, which are female and result from a fertilized egg, and 5 to 10% drones, which are the, the male bees. Uh, they're an unfertilized egg and they only exist in the hive from about April through October. They're kicked out in the winter and told not to return, <laughs> sometimes violently kicking and screaming. Uh, they have no stinger, they don't forage, they don't protect the hive, so they're a drain on precious winter resources without actually contributing anything to the hive. Um, as an idea of the life cycle, the queen lays the egg, the egg turns into a larva, the cell is capped, it becomes a pupa, and this is just for the worker bee. So it takes 21 days for a worker, female worker bee, to become an adult bee. And you can see in this picture, all the little eggs, they kind of look like a really tiny grain of rice in the bottom of the cell. And again, more on the life cycle. The queen only takes about two weeks. So she emerges uh, day 16. A worker takes 21 days and the drone takes 24. So it's kind of like two weeks, three weeks and four weeks. Um, and we can see the queen. This is a queen cell on the bottom of a frame. There's a little larva floating in what's called royal jelly, uh, which is a substance that's secreted from the bee's heads. Um, it's also referred to as bee milk. Um, so the queens only are fed royal jelly. The worker bees are fed after the third day, a mixture of pollen and nectar called bee bread. And the pollen actually deactivates the genes that would turn a worker bee into a queen. So it's kind of interesting to see how the bees need the pollen in order to make worker bees for the hive. Um, all of the different occupations that worker bees can have. Their first job is to clean out their cell that they just emerged from. In the first 22 days, they spend in the house doing all kinds of different jobs. A nurse bee feeding the larva, um, queen attendant, mortuary bee carrying out the dead, uh, building wax, feeding the drones, packing pollen in, honey storage, fanning, uh, guarding, carrying water back to the hive. That's how they cool down the hive if it gets too hot. 
day 22 and beyond, they are out flying and foraging. They're looking for honey and pollen or nectar and pollen, <laughs> um, and they fly until they can't fly anymore. So they live approximately four to six weeks in the summer. In the winter, it's up to six months. Um, they make, the queen will start laying bees that are called fat bees. So they're specifically created for winter to survive the winter. They have a larger uh, fat deposit that helps keep them alive and it help keep the hive warm. Uh, winter survival is largely dependent on the health of the hive going into winter. So we make sure that we treat for those Varroa mites in the fall and it prevents the Varroa from weakening the hive. Um, we have all kinds of different diseases and pests, everything from wax moths, hive beetles, and then there are diseases like foul brood, deformed wing virus, nosema, or tracheal mites, and dysentery. So the bees slowly eat through their winter honey stores and they kind of move the cluster around to find the different areas of stored honey. And they vibrate their wing muscles to generate heat and keep the queen alive. So the temperature inside of that cluster is still gonna be 90 plus degrees, nice and cozy and warm, but right outside the, cl the cluster bees that travel out on a really cold day, they can freeze and die just outside of the cluster. Uh, they do need mild days periodically to go on cleansing flights and eliminate waste. And especially if it snowed, you'll see little orange, it <laughs> looks like little orange confetti all over the snow. Um, beekeepers can help them by wrapping them with insulation material, create a windbreak, so stack up bales of hay, uh, fence or something, um, add extra covers to absorb the moisture and condensation from their respiration process um, and provide additional winter feed, which is anything again from a candy board, cake fondant, uh, pollen pat patties, granulated white sugar. There are a bunch of different ways that, that you can add that. Um, we also narrow the entrance and that's to prevent mice from getting into the hive. <laughs> I've seen it happen before. It's you'll, the top of the hive will be, the top box will be all bees and then the bottom there will be a little mouse nest. So it's, it's a, pretty destructive. Well, that's what they look like in winter. So a lot shorter. I always reduce down to two boxes and you can see the mouse guard, which is just that perforated piece of metal in front. So the mice can't get in, but the bees can get in and out. And it gives them a smaller space to defend. The population slowly declines over the winter. Um, so less bees means they need uh, like more resources to guard a larger entrance. So less bees, you wanna give them less space to guard. So beyond honeybees, we also have a ton of amazing native bees, over 400 species in Pennsylvania. And they also do the same work that honeybees do. And they're just as important, if not more so because so much attention is paid to honeybees. But we forget that we have all these amazing native pollinators, bumblebees, carpenter bees, mason bees, sweat bees, leaf cutter bees, mining bees. There are so many different kinds. And they're primarily solitary bees. They nest in the ground, <clears throat> in wood, and so on. Um, bumblebees are valuable because they can do things that honeybees can't do. They have this thing called buzz pollination. So they land on a flower and they buzz and that shakes the pollen out, whereas honeybees can't do that. And they also have longer tongues to get into deeper flowers. So things like um, honeysuckle, uh, bee balm is actually a favorite of bumblebees, but not necessarily honeybees. Um, leaf cutter bees have extra fuzz on their abdomens, so they're really great at cross pollinating, especially fruit trees. Uh, they can also fit into smaller spaces because they're smaller than honeybees. And leaf cutter bees and mason bees are sometimes used in greenhouse pollination because you don't need a large colony, they don't need a lot of space, they can effectively pollinate greenhouses uh, without needing a full hive. Um, and then planting for pollinators. There are so many great native plants that we have. I have a big list of <laughs> all kinds of plants. I know that uh, the little picture here is of a honeybee on um, mountain mint. And I know that that's definitely one of their favorites. It blooms at a time when other resources have kind of dried up. It's gotten hot, it's gotten too dry. Uh, mountain mint is incredibly hardy and it sticks around uh, mid to late summer. So they're just probably gonna start blooming within the next couple of weeks. Um, but it's, it's a neat little flower and native, so that's fantastic. Um, trees, some of our biggest uh, 
blooms and biggest sources of nectar, especially, are the trees. So black locust, tulip poplar. Tulip poplar produces so much nectar, it will actually drip <laughs> off of the plant. Um, and they're these big, beautiful orange flowers, and they're amazing trees to begin with. So uh, linden trees or the basswood uh, have these beautifully fragrant flowers, and they are a, a delight. I, I love walking. There's a stand of them outside my house, and I love walking by them when they're blooming. Maples in the spring, the red sugar and silver maples are all important to get the bees up and running. Um, those sources of uh, pollen and nectar earlier on are what really get them running in the spring and build up the hive faster. Um, some of the fun shrubs, the witch hazels are great because they bloom at odd times. There's a spring one that blooms in like late February, early March when kind of nothing else is blooming yet. Um, and there's another one that blooms in the fall as well. So they have slightly different seasons, but they're both really pretty. The flowers are so unique. Um, they're probably one of my favorites. So it's a pretty extensive list. <laughs> um, how can you help? And native pollinators and honeybees as well, you know, don't treat your lawn. Don't put anything in your lawn other than rainwater. It's really, really simple. All of those herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, you know, tick and mosquito treatments, those are broad spectrum and they're meant to kill all insects, not just the specific insect, especially with the tick and mosquito treatments. Um, so they will harm honeybees and pollinators as well. Cut your grass less frequently, set your mower deck higher, um, set your mower to three or four inches, uh, then the grass doesn't burn as fast because if you cut too low, um, your grass will burn out, especially if it hasn't rained often enough. You can overseed with white clover to add extra clover to your lawn and it is drought tolerant and nitrogen fixing. So it actually feeds your lawn without adding any other substances to your lawn. A plant native flowering plants and trees, even if the honeybees don't visit them, other bees will and they're pretty and they are meant to grow here. So we should always include those in your in your planting plans. Um, add a pollinator wa watering station, which can be as simple as a dish with uh, rocks in it. They just need a place to land on that's higher than the water level. I've seen people use corks as well, um, and that works really well. Um, you can, if you have, I just saw the question about mosquitoes, uh, BT, those BT dunks you can put in uh, a water bowl and those affect only mosquitoes, not um, birds or bees. So they're safe because they're a targeted uh, bacteria. So they don't harm pollinators or birds. Um, so if you feel like you're getting mosquitoes, those BT dunks will work just fine. Uh, pollinator habitat or nesting box for native bees. I know you've seen, uh, it looks like a big chunk of wood that has holes drilled in it or, uh, oh, just like that, Laura Todd. <laughs> exactly like that. <laughs> Uh, those are fantastic. Put them up and then especially with carpenter bees, sometimes they'll use that instead of drilling into your shed or your, you know, wood facing on your house. <laughs> uh, advocate for your HOA or municipality to save money by not fertilizing and not using pesticides or herbicides. Let the clover grow, let it be natural. It's, it saves so much money. <laughs> You're putting all this money and time into creating something that ends up being a green desert. There's no food for bees. There's no food for any other insects or birds. And it's, it's really tragic. It should, your lawn should be biodiverse and beautiful, not just plain old green. <laughs> um, Q&A, some of my most popular questions. Honey for allergies is largely a myth. They've done a couple studies regarding honey helping allergies. Um, Bees don't visit plants that generally cause allergies. The allergens have to get into the air. So most of those plants are going to be wind pollinated and they pump out massive amounts of uh, pollen into the air that gets in your nose. The pollen that bees primarily collect comes from plants that flower and the pollen is too sticky and heavy to get into the air. Um, raw versus non-raw honey. Raw honey is unpasteurized and unfiltered and only run through a two-stage trainer. Uh, raw, non-raw honey is sometimes ultra filtered, which removes all of the pollen or it's adulterated and other non-honey ingredients are added. And as with most things, uh, know your beekeeper, know your farmer, ask questions. 
and honey, of course, does not go bad ever. <laughs> I think they found some in Egypt that was still perfectly edible. I don't know that I'd have been the person to try that, but you know, <laughs> it really never goes bad. It crystallizes. You can decrystallize it yourself at home. So um, it's pretty, pretty easy, just in a bowl of water. And I saw another question here about taking honey for com commercial use. Um, they are kind of semi-domesticated. So if I don't take honey off the hive, they will eventually fill in every single space with nectar and honey and have nowhere else to lay eggs. And the hive will either swarm or abscond um, because I'm creating a space for them in this vertical stack of boxes. I have to con constantly either add boxes or take honey off to allow them to um, keep using that space. In the wild, in a feral colony, they'd select a space that would have more variability. So uh, a hollow log or you know an old shed that nobody's using, an old building in somebody's roof, um, they would be able to keep building out. But because they are human managed, I have to take that honey off. Um, and they have kind of been bred over centuries to produce honey. So all of these other uh, native pollinators don't overproduce honey. It's only honeybees. And that's the only insect that produces a food product that we use. Uh, treat and prevent mites. <laughs> uh, treat and prevent the mites that infect the honeybee. Okay, so varroa mites, and I can probably turn this off. I have another slide full of resources that um, Chester County Beekeepers Association, Conserving Wild Bees, Native Bees, um, and I can post that somewhere or maybe on my website, I don't know. Um, so I'll turn that off for now. And let's see, treat and prevent the mites that affect the honeybee. Uh, varroa mites can be treated in a number of different ways. Uh, everyone kind of has their favorite method. Um, I like oxalic acid vapor. So it's also called wood bleach and it's these little crystals you put in a pan. Um, that you attach to a car jumper battery, you put it in the hive and um, it heats up and it turns the crystals into vapor. And that vapor doesn't bother the bees at all, uh, but it does something to the varroa, varroa that affects either their legs or their mouth parts. So they can't attach onto the bees. Um, there are a couple of other, and it's a natural chemical that exists in nature. Um, oxalis, the plant class has oxalic acid in it. Um, and that's what gives it that bitter sort of flavor. Um, there's formic acid, which is another natural chemical. There are a couple of other heavier chemicals. Um, and then there are some kind of integrated pest management methods. So the drone frame, you can let them fill up the drone, all the drone brood, because uh, they seem, the mites seem to like drone brood because they have more time to produce in those, reproduce in those cells. Um, so you can actually take that frame once it's capped put it in the freezer which kills all of the mites and unfortunately all of the drones um and then take it out put it back in the hive uh, and that will help manage the mite levels i haven't done that myself i prefer the oxalic acid method um it seems to work really well for me uh let's see factors in determining how many boxes to use uh so there's a balance between giving them enough space to store nectar and pollen and not having too much space that you invite pests and it's kind of intuitive um if you see that there's too much space and they're not filling it you put an extra box on one week you go back and it's still empty it was probably too early if you don't put enough boxes on and you see them back filling the area where the queen should be laying with nectar um, you need another box <laughs> as soon as possible. So it's very, it's kind of feels like passing notes sometimes with the bees. Um, you give them a hint, like you give them extra space and then they fill it with nectar and it's, um, that lets you know that you did the right thing. Um, let's see, next question, the Mason bee box. Um, I'm not sure about attracting. I think just the space alone should attract them. And because it's just the right shape and size for them to nest in, they're naturally going to be drawn to it. But I don't think there's anything you can add to it to attract them. Um, 
I'd have to Google that for sure. <laughs> uh, boxes being direct sun. Um, typically, beehives should be in a mixture of sun and shade. I have had them in uh, direct sunlight and probably about 80% shade and they've been fine. Uh, either way, they're very adaptable. When you think that they live in these feral colonies in the woods, they can't control <laughs> necessarily uh, how much sunlight those get. Um, so it can really go either way, sun or shade. Usually you want about a 50-50 mix and facing usually south or towards the east to get the rising sun. The rising sun sometimes wakes them up faster in the morning so you get more honey production. Anyone else for Melissa? Either unmute or type your question in the chat. Melissa, how did you yourself get started? What, what attracted you to beekeeping? So we had been home brewing and making mead for years and we needed a lot of honey to make mead. So we figured the bees were <laughs> natural next step. <laughs> um, and uh, did that for a number of years. And then just within the last two years, uh, I had gotten really good at it and I was getting a hundred pounds of honey out of each hive and it was more than, <laughs> more than I could use. Ah, swarms. <laughs> I didn't quite go into that. Uh, swarms probably came from another hive or another colony, either feral or a managed hive. Um, it's almost impossible to tell where they came from or where they went. Um, swarms will usually leave their hive, land on a tree, um, and then stay there for anywhere from 30 minutes to a couple of days while they're looking for a home. So they send out scout bees to uh, house hunt, essentially. They're looking for a certain size and shape of space to move into. If they find it quicker, they'll move on quicker. If they can't find it right away, they will hang out and wait till they find just the right one. And hopefully some other beekeeper caught them because free bees are the best bees. <laughs> uh, Phoenixville Farmer's Market, those are actually friends, uh, Jardine Apiaries and they're great people. I sell at uh, Malvern, Eagle View, Devon and Downingtown Farmer's Markets. <laughs> Oh, there we go. One more in the chat. Yes, there are actually four hives at the community garden and you can stop by and say hello to them. Uh, there's a fence around them, so definitely stay outside the fence. And I usually tell people not to stand directly in the flight path. They don't want to sting you, but if you are in the way, sometimes it's an unfortunate consequence. So that front side of the fence is great to stand and watch them. Uh, the flow hive. Yes, I actually have one. Um, it it works exactly as advertised. However, here, because our nectar flow is not as even, it was developed, I think, in Australia. Um, so our nectar flow is not as even. We have a very wild season, but wild and short season. Um, so I didn't find that the flow hive was enough to contain the volume of nectar that comes in very quickly in the spring. Um, so I usually have to use it in conjunction with a standard uh, honey super because um, they fill it up and they can't cure down the nectar fast enough into honey for me to extract it out of the flow hive. But it, it does work as advertised. It just doesn't quite work for our climate. For your time and putting the video together for us and sharing the information and the tips on uh, how we can be friendly to our bees out there. And uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining us tonight. You'll be able to find this video on the library's YouTube channel later this week. Thank you, Melissa. Very enlightening. That was wonderful. Just wonderful. Great job. Great job.
Okay. Thank Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Help. Okay, sure thing. All right. Good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Lois. That was awesome. Oh, thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs>